so glad to see y'all. Um, so before we uh, kick off tonight for uh, The Last Soul Company by Rob Bellman, and he's joined in conversation with, uh, by, with Scott Beretta, uh, I wanted to tell you all about a couple upcoming events that we'll be hosting. Um, so this Thursday at five o'clock, we are gonna host uh, Martha Hall Kelly um, in conversation with Lisa Wingate for the Sunflower Sisters. Um, if you're a fan of historical fiction, I think you'll really enjoy that one. Uh, again, that's Thursday, April 15th at five. And then next Tuesday, also at five o'clock, we'll be hosting Willie Vlotten in conversation with uh, Bill Boyle, who lives in Oxford, for uh, Willie's latest novel, The Night Always Comes. It's um, kind of a compressed timeline all about um, the uh, gentrification of America and the struggles that that entails. Um, and while I've got everybody here, I wanna tell you about a couple events that are later um, this month. Uh, April 26th at noon, we're hosting John Grisham um, for a pre-publication event for his new book, Suli. It's a basketball novel. You do have to buy the book to attend and we will send you that invitation automatically as soon as you buy it at Square Books. Those are signed first editions. And then um, I don't know if anyone's thinking about Mother's Day yet. You probably should be. Uh, a great gift would be um, to buy your mom or mother figure a ticket to Elizabeth High School's virtual book launch for Come On Over. That's May 4th. You can find more information about all of these events at squarebooks.com slash event. Um, but enough about them. <laughs> Let's move uh, to, to Rob and Scott. I'm just gonna read some quick bios and I'll go away and let y'all start talking. Uh, Rob Bowman uh, has been writing professionally about rhythm and blues, rock, country, jazz, and gospel for close to 50 years. Nominated for six Grammy Awards in 96, he won the Grammy for the best album notes category for a 47,000 word monograph he penned to accompany a 10 CD box set that he also co-produced, The Complete Stax Volt Soul Singles, Volume 3, 1972 through 1975, put out by Fantasy Records. In total, he has produced and compiled and or written liner notes for over 250 CD sets. He's also the author of Soulsville USA, the story of Stax Records, winner of the 1998 ASCAP Deems Taylor and ARSC Awards for Excellence in Music Research. In 2013, Soulsville USA, the story of Stax Records was inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame. Welcome, Rob. Um, and he is joined by uh, Scott Beretta, who's based in Greenwood, Mississippi, and he is a writer and researcher for the Mississippi Blues Trail, the host of Highway 61 on Mississippi Public Broadcasting, and an instructor of sociology and anthropology at the University of Mississippi. He is the former editor and continuing uh, contributor to the Living Blues magazine published by the Center for the Study of Southern Culture and was a co-producer for the film Shake Them On Down about Mississippi Fred McDowell. McDowell's Grammy nominated album, A Do Not Play No Rock and Roll was recorded at Malico Studios by Malico co-owner Wolf Stevenson. Phew, all right. So that's enough for me. Um, I encourage y'all to submit any questions you may have for Rob or Scott in the Q and A and um, I'll come back later and we'll kind of moderate those. But um, thank you guys so much for doing this and um, I will see y'all around, have fun. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back in Oxford virtually. Uh, I'm usually there every week. And Rob, it's great to see you again. I think the last time I saw you was outside the Ryman Auditorium at the Sweetheart of the Rodeo. That's show. right. What a great show. show. With uh, Marty Stewart's band and a couple of the birds. A pretty amazing show. Uh, and uh, we've met uh, many times before that. Um, but uh, so the book is Malico, The Last Soul Company, the Malico the, excuse me, The Last Soul Company, The Malico Record Story. And for those of you who don't know, Malico is a label that formed in Jackson in the late 60s and is still operating today. As the title suggests, it's largely associated with soul music. Those of you all who know the uh, label know artists like Dorothy Moore, Bobby Blue Bland, Little Milton, ZZ Hill, uh, Bobby Rush, Johnny Taylor, uh, many more. Uh, but it's also a huge gospel label, both in terms of the many artists they've recorded over the years as well as in archival uh, terms that they own the historic Apollo and Savoy catalogs going back to the, I think the late 40s, um, throughout the 50s, sort of the golden age of, of gospel music. And on the cover of the book, if you could hold that up, uh, Rob, uh, it's 
you got the strength to hold up that big huge book there's That's Fred heavy. McDowell on the cover so it's kind of funny that the, the last soul company and uh, we've got Fred Fred had a lot of soul but he's usually not categorized as a uh, a soul artist uh, but uh, he, he plays a very important role in Malico um, and if you can pick up the book I wanted to, you saw how big it is and one of the things about this book is that it's uh, uh, published self-published by Malico and one of the benefits of that, Malico has a great uh, distribution wing, but can you just flip through and talk a little bit about all the pictures in that book, Rob? It's, it's crazy. Let me see if I can do this without getting too awkward here. But uh, <laughs> one of the great things is um, when Malico is publishing their own book, they have access to their photo archive. And their photo archive is immense. Um, they really, Tommy Couch, who commissioned this book, really wanted a coffee table book in terms of quality of paper, size, number of photos. But at the same time, he wanted a book with the sort of kind of text you get in a regular um, you know, history book on a record label. So it's lavishly done. It's uh, not cheap because of that, but it's absolutely a gorgeous job. I can take no credit for the pictures, but it's, it's beautifully uh, illustrated. And that was uh, you know part of his idea. In some ways, it was based around the fact that the label was coming up on 50 years, uh, depending how you date the beginning of the label. And some people even within the company argue the date. But it was coming up on 50 years when he asked me if I wanted to do the book. That's now about 52 years, 53 years, depending where you want to put that date. And so they had this great photo archive. He knew I knew the history well. I'd interviewed a lot of the players, many of them who are now long past, but I had interviews with them. And... Uh, so there we go. And it really is a story about the soul blues genre, uh, which Malico, of course, was famous for in terms of the first half of the 1980s when they resurrected the careers of people like ZZ Hill, Little Milton, Bobby Blueland, Johnny Taylor, Denise Russell, or maybe another way of putting it, those great soul artists from the 60s and then Bobby Blueland's case from the 50s made Malico a going concern at that point. And then they did pivot. The world pivoted, and we can talk about why if you like, Scott. But they yeah. pivoted to being mainly a gospel label. And that's really what they've been for the last 25, maybe even 30 years. Wow. And they are literally the biggest black gospel label in the world. They dominate, dominate the world of mass choirs between the Savoy catalog and then what they've done on their own with their own catalog. It's extraordinary. Um, and I guess there's one other piece to that I should mention. And there's lots of other things we can talk about. But before dominating the mass choir world, Malico did with gospel quartets what they'd done with the soul blues artists. A whole string of quartets, the Jackson Southern Airs, the Sensational Nightingales, the Pilgrim Jubilees, the Soul Stirs. These are you know, iconic names from the 50s and 60s in the 70s and 80s, nobody wanted to sign those artists. The quartet thing was no longer important in the gospel world. And Malico was there with open arms. And in effect, just as they'd done with Bobby Blueland, CZ Hill, they were taking artists to the major labels and even the major independent labels catering to commercial black music were not interested in. They were signing them and giving them an ongoing careers. And of course, Mal it made Malico very sustainable. So there's several different layers, if you will, to what this label has done. Some people just know the soul blue stuff. A lot of gospel people just know it as a gospel label. And it's really been several different things. And then starting off with some huge soul hits recorded there, like Gene Knight, Mr. Big Stuff, um, you know, King Floyd. Okay, well, I'm going to introduce you now, if you don't mind. We got an intro before, but it, it, telling everybody who you is, who you are, <laughs> takes a while, right? But I was, uh, first of all, I want to note that you have a precedent in writing this book, that you were the author of this uh, six compact, uh, compact disc set that came out in uh, uh, 98, is that right? I think um, the 30, 30th year, or it's, it was marking a 30 year retrospective. Yeah, it came out in 89, I think, or 88. Got nominated for a Grammy. We didn't win, but we tried. Oh, okay. No, okay. Well, this one's, this uh, This was a, uh, okay. But anyways, the that one, you've been uh, nominated for a number of Grammys, six Grammys, and you did win the Grammy for uh, 
for this set. And it was based on, I think, a lot of the research you did for your PhD at the University of Memphis under Dr. David Evans. You studied stacks for how many years? It's a complicated story. The simple, the simple version is, yeah, I did a PhD on stacks records at the University of Memphis with David Evans. Um, that PhD was maybe the first third of my research on stacks. I kept doing stacks research, kept doing interviews for years after that. In fact, did the three box sets, the one you just held up was a combination of this run of two nine CD, one 10 CD box sets that were every sole single label put out from 59 to 75. Those were all done long after I had my PhD. Um, and the book, finally, I finished the book. I put it out in 97. I could have put it out 10 years earlier, but it, it would have been just that much short of what I wanted. I got so much more working on those box sets and I got, finally got access to the court records, all sorts of things I got access to after my PhD. So the book is quite different than the dissertation, but the dissertation is where the work started. Right, and uh, the, the, so this, uh, this book is sort of an encyclopedic story of the label. Uh, and as, as uh, Caitlin mentioned earlier, it got a couple of music awards, but it also led to a pretty cool gig. Uh, I guess you got touring around with the Rolling Stones for three weeks. I don't know if you've got anything to say about that, Trevor. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it was extraordinary. There's, there's an interesting circle to this, Scott. When I was uh, eight years old, I bought my first Stones record. And I remember a year after that, the Stones recorded a song called That's How Strong My Love Is. And I adored this song. I just, you know, I played every day. I pushed my head into the speaker, wanted to get closer to that sound. And Mick talked in an interview about how he learned the song from Otis Redding. Of course, Otis Redding got it from Ogie Wright, but that's a further story. I don't think Mick knew that then. And so I th thought, hmm, I need to check this Otis Redding guy out. So I went down to my local department store, asked for That's How Strong My Love Is by Otis Redding. They didn't have that, but they did have Try Little Tenderness by Otis, which I bought, brought it home, changed my life. It was the first Stax record I ever bought. So the Rolling Stones turned me on to Otis and Stax. Many years later, I write this book, Keith Richards, who is an extraordinary devourer of books. Keith on the road is just reading constantly, constantly, constantly always nonfiction, not all music books, but he does read a fair share of music books. Keith fell in love with this book. He was actually reading it at rehearsals and I saw the copy. He had yellow sticky notes in page after page after page with little notes that he had written. Who would think of Keith Richards as that kind of reader? But anyway, uh, the band decided they wanted to tell their own story in their own words and they wanted to talk about their art, meaning their music, not just sex and drugs. They asked their label, to, or their label, their management to come up with an appropriate interviewer. Management, Charlie told Miss, gave them 10 names. And Charlie goes, they were all shit, except for one. And he was dead. And that was actually Robert Palmer, who obviously oh, right. Memphis and Mississippians will know who Robert Palmer is, a great, great, great writer, somebody who wrote Deep Blues and somebody I admired an amazing amount. Anyway, that was the only writer on the list that the Stones liked at all, but he had passed. And Keith is reading my book and Keith is going, why don't we get this guy? And uh, long story, these rehearsals were actually happening in Toronto, but they had no idea I lived there. And I didn't know this was happening. Um, and eventually, and you know, I told their office, go find them. And I'm not a, hard to find. They found me, got a call for this gig. And it's like, had I just died and gone to heaven. Wow. And uh, any, any, uh stories you recall from there, just like really incredible moments aside from seeing Keith devouring your book. There were a lot of incredible moments and um, I could talk for hours about that, but we won't. I'll tell you though, sitting on a couch with Keith for several hours with Keith holding an acoustic guitar and you're asking him questions about the sessions, let's say for Paint It Black. And he'll start showing you stuff on guitar and saying, well, you know, there's this Tampa Red record. And if you listen to the left hand Tampa Red, uh, you know, of Thomas Dorsey, the piano player on the Tampa Red record, he's playing this bass line. And I thought if I could adapt it this way and blah. And of course, I know those Tampa Red and Thomas Dorsey records, uh, you know, George and Tom. I was like, his memory was encyclopedic. He could remember moments, 
reasons things came to him. You got this idea of Keith Richards as this, you know, the whole pirate thing he likes to do. He's actually unbelievably sharp, brilliant, and an incredible musical mind. That was a really interesting thing. Mick Jagger can't remember what album, what order the albums even came out in. But Mick can tell you lots of great stories about songs and writing them and stuff, but totally different individuals, totally different, uh, you know, senses of memory. You go into Keith's room and every city we're in, it's always customized. Every room looks the same. They've taken down the, all the paintings off the wall in the Four Seasons Suites. They put up Keith's stuff. The sound system's wheeled in. There's scars over every lamp. It looks like it's the same room, whether you're in Sydney, Australia, or Los Angeles. <laughs> Mick, you go into his suite, it's sparking. It looks like a businessman's suite. There's a fax machine in the corner. You know, he's at a computer over here. There's no instruments anywhere. Keith, there's instruments all over the place. You know, his massive sound system booming out reggae. It's, it was an interesting world. And Charlie, of course, you go to his, his room, he's watching jazz videos all day long or jazz DVDs. Um, and wanted to talk to me as much about King Oliver as the Rolling Stones. I did my MA thesis on King Oliver's Creole Jazz Band, which just fascinated Charlie to no end. And he'd always be wanting to talk about that. It was an amazing, an amazing, amazing, amazing um, thrill of a lifetime. Right. Okay. And you did come out with at least one book, according to the Rolling Stones, uh, which you authored, uh, came out. You did some liner notes as well for the Stones out of, out of that gig, right? Well, and they, used some of the, they used some of those interviews as well in the Crossfire Hurricane documentary movie several years oh, later. Okay. Gave me credit, which was nice. Well, I want to get back to Malico as much as I'd like to talk about uh, Keith. <laughs> but uh, uh, we're uh, doing this through Square Books in Oxford, and the Malico story really got started not at Square Books, but uh, there in, uh, in town over at the University of Mississippi. You talk about the origins of Malico Records there at the university? Absolutely. Tommy Couch grew up in Tuscumbia, Alabama, part of the Muscle Shoals quadrant of cities with Sheffield and Florence. When it came time to university, he had his old miss. And at old miss, he joined a fraternity, common story. And for one reason or another, they decided to make him the social coordinator and he got to book bands. And I believe the first band he ever booked was the Del Rays, led by Jimmy Johnson, of course, you know, famous session guitarist and Muscle Shoals initially for Rick Hall at Fame, later forming the Muscle Shoals rhythm section and having their own studio, Muscle Shoals Sound Studio, where the Stones recorded. And they recorded You Gotta Move by Mississippi Fred McDowell. It's funny how this all comes around and you make the movie about Mississippi Fred McDowell. Anyway, Tommy's an old miss. He books the Del Rays. And Jimmy says to him, and you, Jimmy, from growing up, because they did growing up in the same area in Northwest Alabama. And so he books Jimmy's band, the Delrays, who just play R&B music. And Jimmy says to him, look, if you can get us another gig in the afternoon, maybe, or the night before, night after, I'll give you 10%. Tommy's going, what? I can make money doing this? So he gets him another gig with another fraternity, makes his 10%. He thinks, that's not hard to do. He's a pharmacy major, by the way, and later did work actually at drugstores while he established Malico down in Jackson. So he starts booking, not just for his fraternity, but he starts a small, um, should we say, entrepreneur, small little mom and pop shop, booking bands all over the fraternity circuit in the South. He booked a ton of white bands who played R&B, bands like the Delroys and Marquis and so on. But then he also booked every black band going in the South in these fraternities and made his 10% constantly all over the place. When he graduated, he fell in love with a woman who's from Jackson, Mississippi. So he marries her, moves to Jackson, and he continues to book bands, but now he's booking bands with his brother-in-law, a guy named Mitchell Maloof. That's where the name Malico comes from, Ma from Maloof, Co from Couch, and then the law just to put them together, Malico. Malico Attractions was the company, and they booked the Dave Clark Five into you know, Jackson Coliseum. Then they booked um, the Herman's Hermits with the Who opening up and the Blues Magoos. Then they got their own little club, I don't know how many people or what age who are, you know, listening to this, but there was a TV show called Hullabaloo, which was a teen dance show. Hullabaloo set up a franchise system where you can get a Hullabaloo franchise, pay X amount, and run a Hullabaloo club in your local city. Tommy and Mitch logically figured, hey, nothing happens in Jackson in terms of for young kids. We'll open a Hullabaloo show, uh, club. He's booking every band going, and then he's booking them other places. And then it's like, hmm. 
I don't recall. I grew up in Tuscumbia, you know, Sheffield, Muscle Shoals, that area. Rick's got this great studio, Fame Records. He's making hit records with Aretha Franklin, Wilson Pickett, Etta James. Why don't we start a studio? That's literally how they get into the business. And it, they don't actually start the record label too much later. All their initial recordings were people using their studio, using their house band, people like Wardell Cazera, Wardell Cazera coming out of New Orleans and recording um, King Floyd, Groove Me, Gene Knight, Mr. Big Stuff. Neither one came out of Malico, even though those are, those are Malico records. They weren't really doing the label. They were doing a studio. Um, and those particular records, Groove Me was licensed to Atlantic. Mr. Big Stuff was licensed to Stax. Massive hits. It wasn't really until a few years later when nobody wanted Dorothy Moore's Misty Blue that they finally decided to make a concerted effort with the Malico label. Even that Mississippi Fred McDowell record that we got that beautiful picture of Mississippi Fred in the front of the book, that was recorded at Malico, produced by Walt Stevenson, but it was licensed to Capitol Records. Capitol put that out um, and actually got a Grammy nomination, but it wasn't a Malico record yet, even though recorded their studio with their you know, session musicians and so on. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, uh, so they, uh, they started in, uh, as a um, expert on uh, soul in general and stacks in particular. We're, so Malico is kind of a minor player in the Southern soul field in the sixties and seventies. We say, I mean, they had a couple of hits, but it's really not until the early eighties sort of after what would usually be talked about as sort of the collapse of the soul business, right? With stacks going under, uh, Muscle Shoals, I think they switched over to more country music after a while, a lot of the people left for Nashville. So how do we see what happened to Malico in terms of uh, that sort of collapse that we can, that maybe you could talk about things, the artists they could sign, you mentioned that earlier, some of the behind the scenes people they were able to hire on and uh, they actually gained an actual historic studio. Well, they did eventually buy the Muscle Shoals Sound Studio. That's not till 1985. But what really happens with Malico, the first, let's say 10, 11, maybe 12 years from 67, eight till basically 1980, they're struggling to do what Stax had done and not being all that successful. I guess they're first starting to do what Fame did serving as a studio, letting outside companies come in and rent the studio and use them. They recorded the Pointer Sisters, Peggy Scott and Jojo Benson. Um, James Carr came down and did a session. Rufus Thomas did a session there for Stax. There were all these outside labels using them. Paul Simon actually recorded part of There Goes Raymond Simon at Malico. But of course, they're not making royalties on these records. They're simply renting out their studio. They're, they're being kept alive really through their jingle business and the continuing success of Malico attractions. But they're always trying to record local artists and get somewhere. And they're really not getting very far. They get the occasional licensing like the Mississippi Fred McDowell record. But that was more successful than most they, the stuff. They tried a lot of soul singles by a lot of artists that virtually no one on the Zoom call will have heard of. People like Eddie Houston and so on. Um, some great records. In fact, most a lot of them are on that box set that you held up. But they couldn't get traction until Dorothy Moore. 1973, Tommy Couch had this idea. They could record Dorothy Moore, who was a local Jackson singer that had a little bit of success with a group called the Poppies. But they could record her in this country song that had been done by Melville Montgomery called Misty Blue. This would be a great record. And they did. They tried to license it. Stax turned them down. Atlantic turned them down. Capital turned them down. United Artists turned them down. Nobody wanted it. They tried for about a year and a half and finally gave up. Stax goes bankrupt. Eddie Floyd was one of many Stax refugees who came down to Malico. Eddie Floyd, in fact, did an album on Malico. Eddie Floyd, of course, the guy who did Raise Your Hand, Knock on Wood, Big Soul Hits in the 60s. Um, Eddie Floyd was down at Malico and heard the tape of Dorothy Moore and said, why don't you guys put this out? Tommy said, we've been trying to, nobody wants it. Then he finally goes, you're out of your mind, just press it on your own label. They did, it became their first number one record. They were within about 60 days of going bankrupt. That had sat in the can for two years. And that's really when it became a serious label. But between 75 and 80, Dorothy Moore, a couple records by Fern Kinney, nothing else they could do charts, although they do serve as a studio 
for a rental that creates this massive disco hit, Ring My Bell by Anita Ward, using their house band, their studio, their engineer, Wolf Stevenson. But then magic happens. Arrested Stacks went out of business in 75. TK Records went out of business in 1980. TK was their distributor. TK distributed Ring My Bell. Dave Clark worked at TK. Dave Clark, for those who don't know, had been a promotion man. He's always called the earliest promotion man in the history of African-American music. He was working Jimmy Lunsford records in the 40s on the road going to radio stations. He had been at TK producing all these later soul and then disco records down there. When he needed a job, he came to Malico. It was Dave Clark, this elderly black man, but with a reputation in the industry bar none, everyone knew him, who brought ZZ Hill to the label. That was the first shift, if you will, where instead of Malico trying to record mostly contemporary artists, they're taking an older artist who used to have some at least minor hit records and couldn't find a label. CC Hill couldn't get a label. Disco was big in 75, 76, 77. Funk had come in, obviously, in that period as well. And then, of course, hip hop starts in 79. People like ZZ Hill, Little Milton, Denise LaSalle, none of the major labels wanted them. Most of the independent R&B labels that had specialized in soul music were long gone, Stax and TK being examples, but Duke Peacock as well, Excello, all have gone bankrupt uh, in the late 60s, early mid 70s, or at the very end of the 70s. Malco became the home for what the industry thought of as anachronisms. Second album ZZ Hill does for Malico has an album as a song on it called Down Home Blues. That started getting picked up by these DJs on mom and pop Southern soul stations. There was an audience for this music that most people in the black music business didn't realize. They weren't kids. They weren't people in their early twenties. Those guys were listening to disco, funk and then hip hop. But African-American people in the South, let's say 35 years and older, who had grown up in soul and loved this music, still vital human beings. They still wanted to go see music live and they still wanted to hear their music on the radio. And we get this quick development. Down on Blues takes off as an album cut. And Stuart Madison, who now is one of the co-owners at Palico, said, look, this is happening in a way we've never had a record happen on radio. We are not going to put this out as a single. We're going to make people buy the album. It's the biggest selling blues album in history by an African-American artist. And I say it that way, just in case some people want to argue Steve or Avon or Eric Clapton or somebody, but the biggest selling blues album in history by an African-American artist on Malico. And this is an artist that had been thought of as a soul or R&B artist a few years earlier that nobody was interested in. Denise LaSalle is asked to write some songs for ZZ's next release. She writes a hit record for him. And then they say, Denise, why don't you record? Trapped by a Thing Called Love back in 71 was a great record. Denise had given up as a recording artist. Nobody wanted her. And she really thought of herself, maybe I'll just be a writer. But she signs and then, you know, has records like Lady in the Street and, you know, Your Husband's Cheating on Us and so on. If you look in the Billboard chart books, none of these records, including Down on Blues or Little Mills of Blues are all right. Another massive blues record. None of them chart. None of them can you find in the top 20 of the R&B charts. In fact, you won't find them in the top 100. This is a niche audience, middle-aged and older African-American women and men, largely in the South, but it's a vital audience that will buy several hundred thousand copies of these records. And that's how Malico finally gets on secure footing. And they ride that wave until that style dies. And that style dies largely because when Bush deregulates the radio industry, clear channels start buying up stations by the hundreds at a time. Most of those soul blue stations are taken over. They become clear channel stations and they're not interested in Southern regional programming. And the other thing that happens is the mom and pop stores who stocked all these soul blues records on Malico, uh, most of them start going out of business as we shift obviously vinyl to CD 
They first bootleg a lot of the CDs, which is killing Malico. And then the digital world comes along with Napster and Nutella and so on. And those mom and pop stores lose their basis. So Malico's lost its radio world. It's lost its mom and pop retail. And the soul blues genre effectively becomes history because they can't make enough money selling it because they have no vehicles to deliver it to customers and no vehicles for radio play. They've stumbled into gospel in 75 when the Jackson Southern Airs came by. Jackson Southern Airs had their first hit back in 63 on Duke Peacock. They'd had numerous gospel hits, but Duke Peacock had sold the ABC Paramount. Nashville, another incredible gospel label in Nashville, also went out of business when Ernie Young, its owner, died around the same time. So the two labels that specialized in quartets, Duke Peacock in Houston, Nashville in Nashville, both are out of business. Malico repeats what they've done with the soul blues artists. They start signing all of these gospel quartets, many having hits going back to the 50s, like the Soulsters and Sensational Nightingales. And they find there's still an audience, largely in the South, for these quartets that are now anachronisms for the bigger gospel labels. That's really the Malico story until they start buying up Muscle Shoals, Savoy, which gives them the history of gospel from 1942 forward. Apollo gives them the original Mahalia Jackson records, as well as the Roberta Martin and Caravan records. They buy up the Nessa Bell Armstrong stuff from Onyx. They later buy Atlanta International. And now there's this powerhouse that is the biggest black gospel catalog in the world. And they're doing extremely well with it. It's a totally unlikely story. Jackson, Mississippi, who opens a record company in Jackson, Mississippi? The Soul Blues label didn't even exist. And really all that was was soul singers now singing 12 bar records. It's not straight blues like Muddy Waters. It's not the sort of thing that Alligator Records would put out that largely had a white fan base for most alligator acts. Malico, Tommy Couch always said, we make black music for black people. And it was largely a black fan base. Sure, hipper whites who are, you know, serious uh, black aficionados would buy some of this stuff, but most of their records were not sold to the same white blues fans that were buying alligator and Delmark stuff. It's a different audience, largely a black audience. So sure, you could never have predicted, and they never could have predicted. They sort of stumbled into each step, but they were smart enough to realize what was happening and make it work. Um, and we think about what makes it work. I mean, Malico is, uh, I know they, they were struggling, I know, in the early 2000s or uh, because of, as you're talking about, but I remember being in Jackson back then, and you could go to a gas station and somebody would sell you not an album that came from Malico with 10 songs on it or 12 songs on it. But for $5, you could buy a CD that had 10 to 15 of the top hits that were, you were hearing on WMPR at the time. And I believe Malico actually tried to sue a number of these people, right? Or get police involved in, and the, the bootlegging was serious in the Southern soul world. In a way, it wasn't as serious in the mainstream pop world. Did you say that? The bootlegging was killing them. Tommy Couch Jr., Tommy Couch Sr.'s son, obviously, who's now president of the company and one of the four partners, uh, he told me that, you know, they'd send promo copies to the record stores, typically, because you want the record store to play it in store and get people to want to buy it. But they quickly realized the record stores, several of them, were simply, you know, ripping the CDs, burning copies, and um, selling the burned copies for, you know, five, ten bucks. You wouldn't have to go to the gas station in Jackson. You just go to the record store. Right. This was happening through Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and so on. They, in fact, hired an independent uh, detective company and sent people into these stores to ask for latest releases uh, by various artists. And yes, they did you know, bust several of them, but they quickly realized the game was over. They could bust everybody they wanted. They still weren't going to sell their CDs for what they needed to in enough volume to make that business sustainable. At the same time, they're losing the radio play because of that clear channel phenomena once radio was deregulated in the United States. So they did sign people like Mel Waiters as late as the you know, late 1990s, made some great records for them, but they couldn't sell enough to make it sustainable. The gospel world was different. Those gospel quartets would sell their product, if you will, at their programs. That's how they lived. They made X amount of the program, but they made X amount of more on that merch table selling their latest product. 
Malika always sold more quartet records, probably at programs than they did actually in stores. And they had less of a bootlegging problem, it seems there. But the real smart thing that happened as we move into the late 90s, early 2000s, and we now have a digital world quickly happening with peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Tommy Couch Jr., younger, smart, made the big pivot. He quickly realized, I'm not sure if he would have said this in 2000, but it wasn't too many years afterwards, long before Warner's Universal, um, any of the major labels had figured this sort of stuff out, Sony. Long before that, he thought, you know what? The game's over. Give the music away free. Make it available everywhere you can digitally. The money is in the publishing. The money is licensing in film, television, commercials, hip hop samples, and by the way, Drake, Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, John Legend, Kanye West, they all have sampled Malico stuff. They do very, very well with samples. And then they also license overseas in Japan and Europe. But the idea was, if you give the stuff away, make it all available, music supervisors, people, ad people will hear it. People will find these obscure records and they'll come and license them because they can get them a whole lot cheaper than they can get Soul Man by Sam and Dave. Or I Never Loved the Man the Way I Love You by Aretha Franklin. They're gonna be able to pick up a decent cell sample or cut for a commercial much cheaper. They're gonna to come to Malico. Wolf Stevenson, his job now, he's been the engineer from the beginning. His job now is basically all day long to bake older Savoy tapes and digitize them. They are digitizing the most obscure gospel records that nearly no one heard about when they first came out. Most gospel collectors haven't even seen copies of some of these things, but they're digitizing them. They're all up on YouTube, constantly. They put new stuff on YouTube every day. They're on Spotify, their title. Uh, and the idea is you make the money. These obscure tracks get streamed you know, 1,500 times in one year. Maybe you're making 15 bucks on it. But if you do that with 100,000 tracks, there's some money to be made. Not only that, they get picked up for sampling, get picked up for movies, you're doing well. I mean, Drake uh, sampled the Corinthian Temple Church of God in Christ Choir. How many people know that record? Obviously, some producer working with Drake was hip to that record or found it or probably on YouTube or Spotify because they wouldn't have found it crate digging. There weren't enough of them to find crate digging. And that's, you know, we think of hip hop guys crate digging. Of course, they do that for old vinyl. But a lot of old vinyl they're never, ever going to find because the stuff was so obscure. Malico's making it easy for them to find it digitally. And that's really been the story of the last many years, as well as distributing gospel artists like CC Winans. I'm doing really well with it. Dottie Peoples. Yeah. And we could say something about uh, Wolf's high tech uh, apparatus for uh, baking the old tapes. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen his, the way he bakes his tapes? I've seen it, yeah. It's, it's, it's quite something. I don't even know if I could do justice describing it, given I'm not an engineer. But it's a small room in one of the secondary buildings in the Malico, we'll call it compound. And uh, there's these little sort of, I don't know what you'd call them, looking like uh, actually cooking pressure pots. cookers. Yeah, they're pressure, pressure cookers. cookers, that's right. And um, yeah. he's got them going constantly. And when they're ready, he runs them and digitizes them. And Tommy's like, give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more, put them up there. Uh, it's, it's, it, it was so smart and it's interesting. You know, Malico, all of them, Wolf, Tommy Cup Sr., Stuart Madison, Tommy Cup Jr., they all have been incredibly smart individuals who have adapted and pivoted quickly. They didn't plan to become a label for older Southern African Americans. They wanted hit records initially. It didn't work out for them, but they found something else. They never planned to get into gospel music. That was kind of an accident. And then they began to realize what the future was and quickly embraced it. By the way, they're also, they started the Mississippi Mass Choir. Frank Williams of the Jackson Southern Airs loved the Mass Choir phenomenon. It originally started with the Florida Mass Choir in 79 and the Georgia Mass Choir in 83. They were with the Savoy label, both those choirs. Malico bought Savoy December 31st, 85. So effectively the beginning of 86. Um, and uh, so they now own the two biggest mass choirs. And Frank Williams, who's the head of the a &R at Malico for Gospel and the leader of the Jackson Southern Airs, wants to start his own Mississippi Mass Choir. 
put out their first album in 88, biggest selling gospel album in history up to that point. Now, obviously, people like Kirk Franklin has outsold that probably several times. But in 88, they blew the roof up the gospel world. Stumbled into it in many ways. Frank Williams, it was a vanity project for him. They weren't actually too happy about him doing it. They thought it would take his time away from running their quartet business, but they couldn't say no to him because he's, they, you know, he was part of their family and he was important to them. They didn't want to upset him either. So go ahead, make your mass choir record. Biggest, best thing they ever did. All right. Looking at the time, Caitlin, are we okay with uh, questions or keep going? What do you yeah. think? We are running I'm, kind I'm, of I'm short so, on I'm time. Sort of, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we do have a few questions. Um, Lee McCormick would like to know, and I'm guessing this is for Rob, but uh, Scott, if you have a thought, I'd love to hear it. Maybe Lee would too. Um, is there a Malika compilation or box set that you recommend? Uh, there's two. Uh, there are two. There's this one and there's this. There's a more compact one, I believe, right? No, there's a bigger one. That one you hold in your hand is virtually just a secular label. All, all the soul records and then the soul blues records, as well as, you know, one Mississippi Fred McDowell cut and two gospel songs. But that's it. It's basically the secular career for 30 years of Malico. This box mm -hmm. came out, I guess, last year. It was Grammy nominated. Um, I did not do this box. I brought the forward and I helped out a bit, but it's not my liner notes. It's Bob Merowich's. They are superb. It's an unbelievable box set. It's eight CDs of the Malico gospel story. And that's really the gospel story of Savoy, Apollo, Atlanta International, Onyx, Muscle Shoals, and Malico, because Malico owns it all. So in some ways, it's the history of gospel from the 40s up to 2017, 2016. I can't remember what the last track on that is. So there's those two different box sets cover both sort of parts of Malico, if you will. And by the way, I'll tell you something else about Malico and the box sets. They didn't expect to make money off those box sets. They know they're only going to sell X amount of copies. What those box sets are is for all the people supervising films, music supervisors, supervising uh, television shows, hip hop guys. Those box sets are sort of lost leaders getting the catalog out to people. And it's worked. The one that you held up, they've made much more from samples from that than they ever made from selling it. Smart people. Uh, if you're not a, a, a movie producer I'd and you want it anyway, I'd encourage you to check it um, out our uh, Oxford's local indie record store, Indival Music. I bet they could help you. Um, or if you are um, a movie producer and you've joined us, um, buy it from the Indival Music. They're, they're wonderful. They're both great uh, sets. I mean, yeah. you know, I made one, I'm, I'm involved in them both, but really only one is more mine. Um, but uh, the music's fantastic. I would have bought them if I hadn't been involved in them. <laughs> yeah, uh, there was, there was actually, oh, excuse me. There was actually a record store day uh, record that came out uh, a couple of years ago called 50 Years of Excellence. Uh, so um, if you talk to David over at um, End of All Music in Oxford or your other favorite record store, you can actually get a, 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 a Malico compilation on vinyl. A new one, one that they actually make money from selling. <laughs> and, and I linked that in the chat for anyone who wants to um, find out more about you know, the, uh -huh. the end of all music. Um, well, we're we're about out of time. There's a couple little questions, so maybe we'll call this like a lightning round. Um, Michael would like to know, do, um, do either of y'all know if uh, Dorothy Moore still performs or if she is in good health, good voice? Okay. She's in good health. I know that. Um, I'm not sure about if she's still performing. I haven't heard of performance in a while, but I did have some kind of communication with her about a year and a half ago, and she was doing well. You know what? That's great. And then uh, Linda would like to know, Rob, did the Golden Gate Quartet record at Malico? Uh, no, the Golden Gate Quartet did not record for any of the labels that Malico owns or at Malico. But I recommend that every household should have the Golden Gate Quartet records that were originally done for RCA, but the astonishingly good records. All right, y'all heard it here, folks. Get it anyway, even though it's not from Malico. Um, all right, well, uh, do y'all have any last 
uh, last word sounds kind of too serious, but any parting words, I guess, before we all say good night for now? I'd like to say that uh, I thank you both very, very much for hosting this and setting it up. Uh, Square Books is a legendary bookstore. I mean, I lived in Memphis for three years when I did my PhD, and I heard a lot about Square Books, even though, you know, it's a few miles down the road from Memphis. But uh, always support your local bookstores, not Amazon, if you can avoid it. And um, Heartily you know, agree. <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's important independent businesses, period. But Square Books has been there forever, as far as I know, whatever forever might mean. And it's um, a very special place. So give it your support, whether you're buying fiction, nonfiction, music books, non-music books, it's a hit place and we're lucky to have it. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, and I linked one last time, uh, we have signed book plates on the way for our copies of The Last Soul Company. Um, you can order it online. Uh, or give us a call or go to, um, or just come by and see us. Um, thank you all so much, Scott. Thank you. Um, it's been, it's such a pleasure to see you <laughs> after so long. And Rob, it was so wonderful to meet you. And, and thanks to everybody who also took time out of their evening to join us. Um, hope everybody has a wonderful night and we will um, see you next time. Everybody take care. All right. Bye. Take care, everybody. <laughs>